congratulations, Chris. <laughs> a business executive was feeling depressed. Things were not going well at work, and he started bringing his problems home with him every night. Every evening he would eat his dinner without saying a word, shedding out his wife and five-year-old daughter. Then he would go into the den and read the newspaper, using the newspaper to distance himself from his family. After several nights of this, one night his daughter took her little hand and pushed down the newspaper, jumped in her father's lap, wrapped her arms around his neck, and hugged him with all her strength. The father said, Honey, you're hugging me to death. And she said, No, Daddy, I'm hugging you to life. <laughs> His daughter knew something wasn't right with her daddy, and she was trying to fix it. Her hugs were the best medicine she could think of. In our gospel lesson today, we have two women that had serious problems and were in need of help. Jesus had become somewhat of a celebrity in our, at the, the time of our story. People were coming from all over to hear him and to touch him. Word of his miracles had spread so far, and back in their day there weren't a lot of medical options. Prayers, herbs, offerings to pagan gods, that was about the extent of their medical expertise. People were so desperate for help that the crowds of people coming to be healed by him were crushing. Think of Black, Mark, Black Friday at Walmart. <laughs> In this crowd was a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Even worse, the fact that she was bleeding had deemed her as unclean. And what this meant was that nobody was supposed to touch her as long as her bleeding continued. Her condition prevented her from getting married or from interacting with people. She lived a shunned, lonely, solitary life. How very sad of a life that must have been. How uncomfortable to have that condition for so long. How humiliating to be excluded. Nobody up until this point had been able to help her. The Gospel writer tells us that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. The doctors had been happy to take her money, but she had not experienced any relief. So here she is, broke, shunned, and almost without hope. What do you do when the doctors have done all they can do and you are no better? It still happens, doesn't it? The second woman mentioned in today's story was the only daughter of a man named Jairus, who was the leader of a synagogue. The author Mark mentioning that he was a leader of a synagogue lets us know that this man was a wealthy man, because at that time, the leader of a synagogue, the leadership of the synagogue went to somebody who had the financial means to support the building and do the repairs and keep with the upkeep. It's quite expensive to keep up a building. Just ask any one of our trustees. <laughs> Not much is mentioned about the daughter of Jairus, except for the fact that her father was the leader of a synagogue, and the fact that she was 12 years old, and that she was on the verge of dying. Here he was, a man of wealth and status, begging to have his daughter healed on his knees. The Gospel doesn't tell us what was wrong with her, but we do know she was only 12. We don't know what she was dying of, but we know she was young. At that time, 12 was the age that girls were released from their family to be married, believe it or not. The author, Mark, may have been signifying that, mentioning the number of her age, because that meant that she hadn't been married yet and she still had her whole life in front of her. So here we have two totally different women, one who had wasted many years and money and was a desperate social outcast, and one who was young, dying, privileged, with her whole life ahead of her. But both of them needed rescuing. 
We experience illness and death because we are human. We are human, we get diseases, we get sick, and we die. Human life is a mystery. Our bodies can do very amazing things, but as experience has shown us that life can also be incredibly fragile. Our bodies were designed to, be, to operate and regulate themselves towards specific levels of balance, specific levels of hormones, electrolytes, minerals, sugar, temperature. It's truly amazing what our bodies can do. But when levels get out of balance or whack, like having too much sugar, our bodies become out of balance and we enter a state of illness. But illness is not what God had planned for us. Health and wholeness are the states we were designed to be living in. We were designed to rise and sleep with the rising and setting of the sun. Designed to get grubby in the dirt and the microbes to help us with our good bacteria and our digestive systems. But as a society, we have grown away from our hunter-gatherer and agricultural days, for the most part. And as a society, we've moved far from being in balance with our surroundings. We drive cars instead of running. We stay up late to watch the late show. Some of us are afraid to let our kids or our pets play in the yard because of whatever fertilizers or chemicals we've dumped on them. Human freedom and choice has allowed us to become out of whack with our environment and even our own bodies. Some of us work and sleep at odd times. Some of us eat foods that are highly processed or have too much sugar or fat that we know we shouldn't have and throw our blood sugar out of whack. Some use alcohol or pills to be awake or sleep on demand. The more out of balance we become, the more we are led to a state of disease, injury, stress, anxiety, and sometimes even death. So we turn to the medical industry. Many people face high deductible insurance premiums, which may lead to putting off treatment. Employers who hire people at less than full time so they don't have to offer them benefits. And medication costs that make some people have to choose between taking medication or buying groceries. And in some cases, their medication or paying any of their bills. We as a society have developed lifestyles that lead to being out of balance, lead us to illness, and a healthcare system that while it does some help, needs major adjustments to help the common person effectively. And I don't pretend to have any idea on how to fix the healthcare system, but I do know it is still broke. And I can say this because of the many people that I know and that I come into contact with that still can't afford their medicines that can only afford them if they order from places like Canada or Mexico, or just don't take them because they're just too expensive. And I truly believe that that breaks God's heart. God wants us to be healed. God wants us to live in a state, with health, state of health to be close to him. I read somewhere that almost 20% of the gospel narratives are about healing and an author said it could be argued that the whole gospel is about healing. One long healing event performed by God. Healing the rift between God and humanity, as well as the individual healing accounts. Imagine the bleeding woman who approached Jesus in the crowd. She was an outcast. She couldn't have been anywhere near people or crowds. She wasn't supposed to be anywhere near the crowds. She wasn't supposed to touch anybody because her uncleanliness would spread to others. But she says to herself, if I can just touch his cloak. With all the people around, it was likely that he wouldn't even know. So she pushes her way through the crowds and is able to touch his cloak. But Jesus knows. Jesus always knows. He knows you've got a problem. He knows you've got a need. Jesus knows. You kneel bowed down by your bed, pour your heart out over some situation that seems to have no solution, and Jesus knows. When you take your concerns to God, 
he knows. Now this woman came up behind Jesus and touched his cloak. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she was freed from her suffering. And Jesus knew. He turned around in the crowd, and he asked, Who touched my clothes? Now Jesus' statement, Jesus' disciple statement, you see everybody around you. There were all these people in this big crowd that were all brushing up against him. And it was a ridiculous question to his disciples because there were a million people, you know, at least 20 or 30 people that were probably touching him. But he kept looking around to see who it was. Then the woman, realizing that he knew, came forward, fell at his feet, and told him the whole truth. We can feel for her, can't we? Her condition was humiliating, socially isolating. She probably kept it hidden as best she could for many years. But now it's out there. No more hiding. No more pretending. Now everybody knows. Why couldn't Jesus just heal her in private? Why couldn't he allow her to keep at least one shred of her dignity? But see, this is the point. Exactly because the community had shunned her due to her condition, the community needed to know that she was now free from that condition. Confession is not only good for the soul, it helps us to be restored to our rightful place in the community. Jesus was not exposing her so that she would be embarrassed. He was giving her the opportunity to come forward and to truly be set free. She was rescued from her illness and restored to her community. And miracles still happen. Just ask the parents of a girl named Kaylee Hardick, who was 12 years old when she found out she had a brain-eating amoeba in 2013. Kaylee and two friends had been playing King of the Hill at a water park near, Boston, near Benton, Arkansas. It was there that doctors told the devastated parents that she must have gotten infected water from the water park up her nose, and the creature then traveled along her olfactory nerve into her brain, where it began feasting on her brain tissue. A condition called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. The doctor said it was about 99% fatal, and only two people in North America had ever survived. They had to tell the parents that it was very likely that she would not be alive within 48 hours. In fact, another little boy who was contracted just a few days later died. But still, the doctors at Arkansas Children's Hospital jumped into action, pumping her body full of antifungals and antibiotics as well as a rare, unapproved German drug they got from the CDC, lowering her body temperatures to 93 degrees and putting her in a medically induced coma in an attempt to reduce brain swelling. She was hooked to a ventilator and then a dialysis machine for her failed kidneys. For two full weeks, Kaylee's medical team worked around the clock just to keep her alive. They had good hours and bad hours, not just days, says Dr. Lennon. Slowly her brain became stabilized and doctors decreased her sedation and increased her body temperature. They weren't sure if she would be the same little girl when she woke up. They said, we just don't know. But two days later, she did a thumbs up and her parents knew that she was still in there. Kaylee stayed in the hospital for a total of eight weeks, and she had to relearn the most basic of functions, even swallowing. But eventually, she, she officially became survivor number three in the United States. And she is now a healthy, normal teenage girl. Miracles still happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus loves you and he knows your situation. He is reaching out to you to rescue you, to rescue your loved ones, and to restore you and your loved ones, be it through prayer, the care of physicians or therapists. It may be through healing. It may be through the peace offered by death. But make no mistake, God is alive. 
He is active, and he is still listening. Amen. Amen. Now we have some special music. <laughs> 